about my lineage. When my girls were young, I was already praying about their husband. How about you? I've already been praying for my grandchildren. My little boy that's six, I already pray for his wife. I know not her name. But I pray for them. I pray for their issue. I pray for their children. That they would be godly. That they would walk with the Lord and that they would know the Lord. It's my birthright. It's my heritage that the Lord wants to bring to me that all would want honor the Lord. That none would be lost and that all would gather around the throne of God one day. Here's the arrogance of this man's heart. Chapter 14, 3, 5. He tells his mom and dad, he says, go down to Timnah I have found the woman that I want. Now go get her for me. Boy, could you imagine saying that to your mother and father growing up? Yeah, that's about all I do is just think of it. In my house, there was no doubt who the leader was. It was my father. My father was a bomber pilot in World War II. Almost lost his life on numerous occasions fought for the freedom of this country and Europe and made no apology for it. Didn't put up with lazy men or lazy women. Didn't hang around with the people who, who, who ate the bread of idleness. Hard-working man. And I'm the result of his prayers, and my mother's prayers, that my generation and the generation of my children and their great-grandchildren would be known to the Lord. So here is this young man marrying outside his faith. It's not like he couldn't find a woman among one of the 12 tribes of Israel. His parents even say, surely you can find a fair maiden among all those of the house of Israel. Nah, 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 nah. I want the one down there. Folks. young people. God's going to give you a sense in your own heart when that young man walks into your house. <coughs> that young woman walks into your house. And you'll get a sense of whether that man or whether that woman is for your son or daughter. You just need to believe that. And the children, oh, but he's so handsome. So what? So is King Saul. Oh, but he's so big and strong looking. It doesn't matter because sooner or later we all return to where we have come from. And what is that? Straight. But she's beautiful. Aren't all the ladies beautiful? Amen. Hallelujah. I was thinking that people would be on the feet by now, brother. But again, I press on. <coughs> and so this man, again, demanding, telling his parents what to do. Sign of rebellion in his own heart. He denied his calling. Wasn't it interesting that as we told the story of him destroying the, the lion, pulling the lion apart like a young goat. He goes away and he comes back, and what's happened with the carcass of the lion? There bees have made a nest inside, and there there is honey. He comes back, he's long on the journey. Man, I, oh, I am hungry. I need something to build back my, my strength. Oh, well, there's that lion I killed. What's that buzzing sound? Oh, there are bees. Where there's bees, there's honey. So what does he do? Comes over to the big lion, looks around, opens up the carcass a bit, takes a good scoop of honey. Man, this stuff rocks. Looks at the other side, takes another scoop of it. So on his way home, he's eating it. The scripture says his strength comes back to him. And then what does he do? He gives it to his mother and father. He 
scripture makes it very clear. His parents didn't know that that was the case. So now here was this man with a Nazarite vow, touching a dead carcass, finding some type of temporary sustenance in something that's dead, and then gives it to his mother and father. Wow. Here is this man who could not control his sexual urges. Can you say sex in this church? Yeah, that was a slow response. <laughs> yeah. Sexual urges. Yeah. Anybody ever had one? No, one hand went up. Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. We have one honest man and woman among us. So here was a man who again was not thinking about the 12 tribes of Israel and the fair maidens among the tribes. But what does he do? He goes into a prostitute. Has his time. Boy, do we ever live in a time of sexual promiscuity. You can go online, for those of you that are not familiar with that term, you can turn on a computer. You can go to Internet Explorer. You can go to a word search engine called Google and type in any word you want that has anything to do with sex, and you can have direct portal right into hell. Things that you would never even think of imagining are there in full color. No need to go down to a Becker store and be embarrassed by grabbing a magazine. You can go online in the comfort of your home while you're eating pizza and drinking coke. Because this is what our young people are facing every single day. No different in Samson's time. <coughs> Much different than our time. Men and women, godly men, godly women, are falling and failing because hell is open. The grave is broad, and we're not praying. We're not praying. You see, one of the things that I don't like to eat is this thing called liver. I'm going to be really joking with it. Some of you. Yeah, I can't eat this stuff. You know, my mom, you know, she would, you know, my dad would say to me in this very broad Scottish accent, oh, it's great, lad, you'll love it. Oh, you just put some onions in it, like a bit of mustard. Oh, it's just, it's the hot meal. And I'm like, no, it's not. I'm not eating it. Oh, it's kind of like, oh, you just take it. You cut it off. It's got to be thinly stripped. And you just cook it with some onions and maybe some lentils and some beans. Oh, it's just great. And the first time I put that thing in my mouth, and there was a little, little trigger back here somewhere, I'm like, I couldn't do it. Many a night that I sat at the dinner table at 8.30 and 9 o'clock at night trying the patience of my parents. And thank God, after about, I think I was eight or nine years of age, when we bought a dog named Tia. <laughs> Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. This little dog saved my life more than once. I put it in my mouth, wouldn't even chew it. I go, <coughs> <laughs> that dog was my best friend. You see, when I'm prayed up, and you put liver in front of me, there's no way I'm going to eat it. But when I'm not in the Word, and when I'm starving, and I'm hungry, yeah. well, I'm going to think about it. So here we have churches of emaciated Christians. Nobody gets to preach the word because the scripture tells us in the last days people are going to gather around for themselves yeah. pastors, preachers, that will tickle their ears. Yeah. You know, we're, we've got all these books on psychologies now, sure. right? Yeah. We've got all these books now about how to do this, and self-help and all you need to think about is, is being better. Wham, bam, you're all of a sudden better. You don't need a cross. What for? The cross is for weak people. 